Good afternoon, scholars. Welcome to your last class of the week. And we have shown kind of steady improvement throughout the week as we get to this point. So my, my push for you is to finish this uh, week of assignments strong. So it's typically been a downturn on the Friday assignment, even though you have two extra days to do it, which doesn't quite make sense. So let's, um, let's push to get an uptick in our turn-in rate because we've got two days in a row now where um, we have a higher turn-in rate than the day before. Um, we're up 2% from yesterday, and yesterday we were up 3% from the day before. So that is a move in the right direction. Um, part of that move in the right direction is because um, we've got students that are really getting on board. I heard Raja was a rock star yesterday in office hours, as was G. Ray. Um, I've got some work I'm going to highlight from Gladys. So there's more and more students who are starting to um, understand that this work is not extra. It's not simply just homework. This is your actual learning. And I want to try to um, push you guys to, to change the way that you might be thinking about um, this class, right? The last time you left campus, you know, in spring break, that's the last time you're ever gonna be on that campus as a sixth grader. It's time to shift into seventh grade mode. And our current seventh graders are actually um, turning in a lot more of their work than sixth grade. Fifth grade students at both campuses are turning in more work than sixth grade. As a sixth grade as a whole, we're really um, kind of not stepping up at this time. And I think one of the reasons our seventh graders are stepping up so much is because they understand that, that high school is right around the corner. You know, they're just in, in just a little over one year, they're gonna be starting their high school journey and they wanna make sure they're ready for it. You guys are basically now seventh graders. Um, the, the work that I'm hitting you with is at a, at a higher level than the work that we are doing in class. And um, I want you to start to, to shift your thinking into seventh grade mode, right? Because we don't have any AZ merit for your sixth grade year. We're never gonna have that. So you gotta get ready for seventh grade because for those of you who have um, big goals of going, of getting into those selective application programs that you, we have throughout Phoenix, whether it's, um, it's uh, Phoenix Bioscience or North High School's International Baccalaureate Program, um, if you want to get into, um, I'm sorry, uh, the Fire Science Academy, there's there's a few of the high schools of the top free public high schools that you still have to apply for. And part of the application process is they want to see your GPA throughout middle school. And the test scores they want to see are your sixth and seventh grade AZ merit scores. You're not going to have AZ merit scores for sixth grade because it was canceled because of coronavirus. Seventh grade is going to be your only chance to knock out the AZ merit and, and get a, a test score that will show these schools that you're applying for just how bright you are, right? Some sc other schools that you might be applying for might be some of the private schools, Brophy, uh, Xavier, St. Mary's, Phoenix Country Day. They're going to want to see your seventh grade merit score, uh, AZ merit scores. So well, we got to make sure um, our grades are good between and uh, our AZ, we're getting ready for the seventh grade AZ merit scores. You got to make sure you're ready for high school. And um, skipping out on this work or, or doing really, really poor effort is not going to get you there. Okay. Um, so let's let's uh, let's start to kind of catch up to the excellent work that the grade above you and the grade below you is doing, um, because it's it's just kind of we're not doing what we need to be doing. So it's a little bit embarrassing for. Uh, for us as a school, the, the effort that we're giving as a whole at sixth grade. That is not to say there's, there's not some of you who are, who are not crushing it. So um, I'm talking about Mirage, Jada, Elvia, G. Ray, uh, Israel N's been, been killing it. Uh, Camila got on board. I've got excellent work from Tierra. Um, Eric has stepped up and gotten on board. There's, there's a lot of you, Joao. Um, who have been doing a great job. And so I don't mean to fuss at the whole group as if you're all one person, because I know you're not, um, but there are at least half of us whose effort is just kind of unacceptable. 
Let's get into check yesterday's, some of yesterday's exemplars. Yesterday was a, a two, just two questions. The first one was um, yesterday's <laughs> readings. You can hear Carter in the background. Um, yesterday's readings were really juror, the 10th juror showing us his true beliefs and feelings and thoughts, and they're very racist. And the question that was posed was, why did Reginald Rose write those words in there? Why did he write this character? What theme is he trying to teach us, show us, or warn us? Um, this was tricky because it required you to zoom out and not just talk about Juror 10, but what Juror 10 could be showing us about life. Two strong examples were Daylin's and Elvia's. Daylin did a really good job at zooming out. Okay, she didn't talk about Juror 10 as much as she she should have because he was the focus. We were supposed to look at Juror 10 and then zoom out, but she did a great job with that zooming out part. She said, the author is trying to show the world has a lot of racism, how many hate others for their looks or their race, and people like him are very racist because they don't like certain people for their race. The author is warning us to say how racism is still around in life, even to this point, I think a theme might be that even though life has been upgraded with many things, one thing that has stayed the same would be racism. I, I agree, Dale, and I do think he's pointing out like this is still there. Elvia did a good job really examining Juror 10 and pulling a theme from that. She said, Reginald Rose wrote the 10th juror's dialogue in this section to show how a racist person can use their biased thoughts to show they are superior to a boy, to people like the boy, and try to put them down. The 10th juror's dialogue proves he thinks Puerto Ricans are the enemy, and even if it's against the law, they have to do everything they can to bring them down. The theme is conveyed, the theme that is conveyed is people will be unfair to others if they think they are important, especially with race. So yeah, some people just can't, it's gonna chain cloud their judgment. And then I'm gonna show you Gladys's tracker before I show you my own response to this question and my own tracker. Gladys did a good job um, speaking as if she is the, the jurors and it's, uh, her answers are accurate. She says the third juror thinks he's guilty because the woman saw him killing. Um, the woman saw the boy stab his dad. She says the tenth juror would say, "I think he's, uh, I think he's guilty because, uh, because he thinks they're mean and vicious." And then she thinks the twelfth juror is kind of mixed with the evidence, but he changes his vote to guilty because there's a lot of it. Let's take a look at my answers. All right, here's my response to why the theme that Reginald Rose might have been showing. I said, in this section, the 10th juror's racist views fully come to light. So I start off with some quick context, which you can do before you get to your point. Now I get to my point. Reginald wrote this section to demonstrate how racism and prejudice in America are obstacles are, are a major obstacle to justice for all. The 10th juror is one of 12 strangers tasked with determining the fate of a troubled Puerto Rican teenage boy accused of murder. His case is built on extremely shaky facts and testimony. He is assigned a lawyer who barely lifted a finger in his defense. To make matters worse, 10th juror is extremely racist. It seems that he accepted the jury duty in this case specifically to see the boy found guilty. He believes the boy's race poses a threat to his own. He wants to see them killed regardless of the facts of the case. Quote, I say get, get him before his kind gets us. I don't give a GD about the law. I'm taking Joel's advice and not cursing, even though it's in the book. Rose included this character to show one of the dangers of America's legal system. The Founding Fathers created a system of jury of peers in order to make things more fair. Fortunately, racism also runs deep in the United States. A jury of peers is much more likely to benefit a white defendant than a non-white defendant. 
Rose is showing us the racism that still occurs in the legal system in order to make us aware and possibly spark change. So I do think that um, the theme that Rose was showing us was how racism can stop people from getting the justice that they that they deserve. You know, in this case, I think it's pretty obvious that the boy probably didn't do this crime. But when you've got people like the 10th juror who have the ability to shape um, his life, things can go bad. And racism is one of the causes of that. Here's my chart. If I was speaking as a third juror, I would say, I think he's guilty because he's a punk kid who hated his father. The third juror really has it out for this kid and something about the relationship between the father and son that he just won't let go. The fourth juror would say, I think he's guilty because there are so many convincing facts and testimonies against him. So he, it's, it's, the fourth juror never really, um, he's not like the third and the tenth juror who seem to have something personal about this. He just seems to be a guy that's convinced by the, he, he really thinks these facts show that the kid did it. The tenth juror would say, I think he's guilty because he's a born murderer. You know, the tenth juror thinks he was just born evil. And the twelfth juror, he's the one who keeps flip flopping. But in this, in the segment we read yesterday, he changed his vote to guilty from not guilty when they reminded, uh, when they reminded that there was that neighbor across the street who saw the killing. That's when he, he said, "Well, okay, I think he's guilty because there's an eyewitness that saw it." All right. Let's take a look at today's assignment. Don't mean to spoil it here, but the fourth and the twelfth jurors start to have some doubt. You just need to explain how they, what convinced them that, um, what what made them start to have some doubts about the boy's guilt. Here's the second question, and it's really similar to the first question yesterday. So if you had a hard time really looking at the 10th juror and coming up with a theme that the author is trying to um, to teach, one of the themes that we're trying to teach, you get practice with it again today. Now that you've seen some exemplars, you've gotten some feedback on it. Let me rephrase this so it's like it yesterday. What theme? Rose trying to teach his audience. Okay, so this is another theme. So on the last two pages, we finally learn the third juror's motivation for wanting the boy to be found guilty. What is it? All right, why has, why has the third juror wanted this kid to be locked up and killed so bad? And what theme might Rose be trying to teach us by including this guy. So just like yesterday, we said he included the 10th juror to show us that racism is still alive and it's still here in the United States. And like I said, it's still here and it could stop some people who from getting justice. That's why I said um, the 10th juror. So if I were to fill this out for the 10th juror, I'd say the 10th juror equals, he's racist, you know? Why did the author include this one? I argued to show that racism can prevent justice. That was the lesson. So what was the 10th juror? He was racist. And why would he include it? To show that racism can prevent justice. That's where I zoomed out to say the bigger lesson or the bigger theme. So in this section, what is the third juror? What's his flaw? And, and then you zoom out. Why would the author include somebody with that problem or that flaw? Why would he include them in the story? What's he trying to show us? In, in this case, maybe what's he trying to warn us about? Okay, so you really got to pay attention to what's up with the third juror. 
then we can figure out what Rose might be trying to show us. All right, let's pick up on page 67. I mean, I mean 76, 76, right here. The, the third juror had just said something rude to the 12th juror, but now he's trying to move on. We're gonna start here, the fourth juror. All right, maybe we can talk about setting some kind of time limit. Remember that the, some of the jurors are saying, let's say that we're a hung jury, let's just quit on it. All right, maybe we can talk about setting some kind of time limit. Still polishing his spectacles, he turns and peers up at the clock. The time is, he squints and puts on his spectacles. Third juror, quarter after six. Fourth juror, looking at the clock, quarter after six. He removes his spectacles and lays them on the table. He looks tired. He closes his eyes and clasps his fingers over the marks left by the spectacles at the side of his nose. He rubs these areas as he speaks. Someone before mentioned seven o'clock. I think that's a point at which we might turn, begin to discuss the question of whether we are a hung jury or not. The ninth juror looks closely at the fourth juror and obviously has a thought of something tremendously exciting. Ninth juror to the fourth juror. Don't you feel well? Fourth juror. I feel perfectly well, thank you. To the others. I was saying that seven o'clock would be a reasonable time to. Ninth juror. The reason I asked about that was because you were rubbing your nose like, I'm sorry for interrupting, but you made a gesture that reminded me. Fourth juror. I'm trying to settle something here. Do you mind? Ninth juror. I think this is important. Fourth juror. Very well. Ninth juror. Um, you guys, if you don't mind, I'm going to stop saying juror. Just kind of, I'm just going to say the numbers. If that, I hope that's not confusing. Fourth. Very well. Ninth. Thank you. I'm sure you'll pardon me for saying this, but I was wondering why you were rubbing your nose like that. Third. Oh, come on now, will you please? Ninth. Now, I happen to be talking to this gentleman here, to the fourth. Now, why were you rubbing your nose? Fourth. Well, if it's any of your business, I was rubbing it because it bothers me a little. Ninth. I'm sorry, is it because of your eyeglasses? Fourth. It is. Now, could we get onto something else? Ninth. Your eyeglasses made these deep impressions on the sides of your nose. I hadn't noticed that before. They must be annoying. Fourth. They are very annoying. Ninth. I wouldn't know about that. I've never worn eyeglasses. He points to his eyes and smiles. Twenty twenty. Seventh. Listen, will you come on already with the optometrist bit? Ninth to the fourth. The woman who testified that she saw the killing had these same deep marks on the sides of her nose. Eighth. That's right, she did. There's a silence in the room and a babble of ad lib conversation. Ninth. Please, just a minute and then I'll be finished. I don't know if anyone else noticed that about her. I didn't think about it then, but I've been going over her face in my mind. She had those marks. She kept rubbing them in court. Fifth, he's right. She did do that a lot. Ninth, this woman was about 45 years old. She was making a tremendous effort to look 35 for her first public appearance. Heavy makeup, dyed hair, brand new clothes that had been worn, that should have been worn by a younger woman. No eyeglasses. See if you can get a mental picture of her. Third, what do you mean no no glasses. You don't know if she wore glasses just because she was rubbing her nose. Fifth, she has those marks. I saw them. Third, so what? What do you think that means? Foreman, listen, I saw him too. He's right. I was the closest one to her. She had these deep things. What do you call them? Oh, uh, you know, the fourth juror massages the spot in his nose where they should be. Third, well, what point are you making here? Foreman, she had those marks. Third, 
She had dyed hair and marks on her nose. I'm asking you, what does that mean? Ninth, could those marks have been made by anything other than eyeglasses? Fourth, no, they couldn't. Third to the fourth, listen, what are you saying here? I didn't see any marks. Fourth, I did. Strange, but I didn't think about it before. Third, well, what about the lawyer? Why didn't he say anything? Eighth, there are, there are 12 people in here concentrating on this case. 11 of us didn't think of it either. Third, okay, Clarence Darrow. And what about the dis, who's Clarence Darrow? <laughs> Let's look up who Clarence Darrow is. Clarence, an American lawyer. Okay, so he was like a, just a famous lawyer. So the third, the third juror is kind of trying to mock the eighth juror. Okay, Clarence Darrow, then what about the district attorney? You think he'd try to pull a trick like that? Have her testify without glasses? Did you ever see a woman who had her glass eighth? Did you ever see a woman who had her glasses and didn't want to and didn't want to? Oh, my bad. Eighth. Did you ever see a woman who had to wear glasses? and didn't want to because she thinks they spoil her looks. Sixth, my wife, listen, I'm telling you, as soon as we walk out of the house, eighth, maybe the district attorney didn't know either. Sixth, yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. Third, okay, she had marks on her nose. I'm giving you this, from glasses, right? She never wore them out of the house so people would think she was gorgeous. But then she saw this kid kill his father in the house, alone. That's all. Eighth to fourth. Do you wear your eyeglasses when you go to bed? Fourth. No, I don't. No one wears eyeglasses to bed. Eighth. It's logical to say that she wasn't wearing them while she was there in bed, tossing and turning, trying to fall, and sl fall asleep. Third. How do you know? Eighth. I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm also guessing that she probably didn't put on her glasses when she turned and looked casually out the window. And she herself said that the murder took place just as she looked out and the lights went off a split second later. She couldn't have had time to put, to put glasses on then. Third, wait a second, eighth. And here's another guess. Maybe she honestly thought she saw the boy kill his father. I say that she saw only a blur. Third, what do you know about what she saw? How does he know all these things? To the eighth, you don't know what kind of glasses she wore. Maybe she was farsighted. Maybe they were sunglasses. What do you know about it? Eighth, I only know that the woman's eyesight is in question now. Eleventh, she had to identify a person 60 feet away in the dark without glasses. Second, you can't send someone off to die with evidence like that. Third, don't give me that. Eighth, don't you think that the woman might have made a mistake? Third, no. Eighth, it's not possible. Third, no, it's not possible. Eighth to the twelfth juror, is it possible? Twelfth, yes. I say not guilty. Eighth to the tenth. Do you still think he's guilty? Tenth. Yes, I think he's guilty. But I couldn't care less. You smart. Do whatever you want to do. Eighth. How do you vote? Tenth. Hazel, go downstairs. Eighth. How do you vote? Tenth. Not guilty. Do whatever you want. Third. You're the worst son of a... I think he's guilty. Eighth. Does anyone else think he's guilty? Fourth. No. I'm convinced. Pause there. Take a minute to answer number one. How do the fourth and twelfth jurors come to have reasonable doubts? This should be at least three sentences long. Don't give me one sentence on this. You see it's worth three points, so it requires a full explanation. Continue typing your answer. Pause if you're not done. 
we're going to look at number two, reminder. We're now going to focus on the third juror. We, what do we learn about why he wants this boy to be found guilty? And what does that show about him? So the third juror would equal what? Okay. And why would the, what is, what, what is Rose trying to teach us by including this guy and including his reasons for wanting him to be found guilty? What's the matter with you? Fourth, I now have a reasonable doubt. Ninth, it's 11 to one. Third, well, what about all the other evidence? What about all the stuff, the, the, the knife, the whole business? Second, you said we could throw out all the other evidence. Eighth to third, you're alone. Third, I don't care whether I'm alone or not. It's my right. Eighth, it's your right. Third, well, what do you want? I say he's guilty. Eighth, we want your arguments. Third, I gave you my arguments. Eighth, we're not convinced. We want to hear them again. We have as much time as it takes. Third, everything, every single thing that came out in that courtroom, but I mean everything, says he's guilty. You think I'm an idiot or something? You lousy bunch of bleeding hearts. You're not going to intimidate me. I'm entitled to my opinion. I can sit in this room for a year. Somebody say something. Others watch silently. Why don't you take, take that stuff about the old man, the old man who lived there and heard everything? Or take the knife, what, just because he found one like it? The old man saw him right there in the stairs. That's the diff, what's the difference between how many seconds it took? What's the difference? Every single thing, the knife falling through the hole in his pocket. You can't prove that he didn't get to the door. Sure, you can hobble around the room all you want, but you can't prove it. I'm telling you, every single thing that went on has been twisted and turned in here. That business with the glasses, how do you know she didn't have them on? Woman testified in court. Well, what do you want? That's it. The others are silent. That's the whole case. The others are silent. That whole thing about hearing the boy yell, the phrase was, I'm gonna kill you. And that's what he said to his own father. I don't care what kind of man that was. It was his father. That rotten kid. I know him. What they're like. What they do to you. How they kill you every day. My God, don't you see? How come I'm the only one who sees? Jeez, I can feel that knife going in. Eighth, it's not your boy. He's somebody else. Fourth, let him live. There's a long pause. All right, not guilty. The foreman moves to the door and knocks on it. The guard unlocks the door and enters. Form, foreman. We have a verdict, guard. All right, gentlemen, take your seats in the jury box. The foreman and the other jurors collect their jackets, etc., and all except the third and fourth jurors follow him off. The third juror remains seated. Finally, he and the eighth juror remain in the room. The eighth juror puts on his own jacket and brings the third juror's jacket to him. The third juror rises. The eighth juror helps him on, helps him on with his jacket. The third juror exits. The third, the eighth juror follows, but pauses at the door and look back, looks back at the empty jury room. The knife still sticks onto the table. The eighth juror exits. The rain has stopped. I highly recommend you guys um, listen to the audio version, the audio play version of this one. It's better than the one, the read aloud that I just did. But what did we learn about? what was driving the third juror in um, wanting this boy to be found guilty, right? It was something with his son. I'll help you out with this one because your job is really to explain this, right? Right here. If you remember from earlier, 
in the play. The the third juror first he kind of showed his temper when he was talking about his son who had punched him in the face and he'd never seen him since, right? You'll notice throughout the play, the third year keeps talking about kids, teenagers, what they're like, right? Now we see that this whole time, the third year was only thinking about his own broken relationship and heartbreak and anger towards his own son. And it was completely, completely putting it towards this boy who was not his son, right? What we call that is personal bias, right? It's when you have a way of seeing things based on personal experiences and it clouds, you apply it to everything, okay? Um, so this, this would be called a personal bias that the third juror kind of has and represents. Now I want you to do the theme work. Why would, why would the author throw in why would he feature this character of personal bias? What's he trying to teach us about it? You know, what's he trying, what's the theme here? That's your job to come up with that one, okay? But I've kind of named for you what the third juror represents. Just like the 10th juror represented like racism, the third juror represents, represents kind of a, a biases, you know, that are, that are personal, that we apply to other things that maybe they shouldn't be applied to, okay? Let's do a great job this weekend. Let's get this work turned in and uh, to the best of our abilities. And I will see you guys uh, on Monday. Joao, I didn't curse. I hope, uh, I hope you approve of, of this recording. All right, see you guys Monday.